Well, Rick, I did some reading, a little bit of um, DD about yeah. State Street before you came in. Quite staggering the numbers, $2.9 trillion in assets under management. And the firm's also the, the creator um, of the first uh, ETF, Passive Strategy. But you employ both passive and active strategies. Well, let's get into a couple of um, your current views. Um, you're, you're visiting Australia, presenting to investors about how you see the world playing out in 2020. Very difficult task to do. Uh, you and I had a call last week and you suggested that you thought everyone was a little bit too bearish on the outlook. And yeah. since then, we've had developments with coronavirus. Does your the world is too bearish uh, view still stack up? And, uh, and what are some of the key pillars to that, that, um, that idea? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. It's always hard to balance the short term and the long term. We all feel like we're being you know, epidemiologists looking at coronavirus. On coronavirus, we think it's going to be a short economic impact that will be quite, um, quite um, sharp, uh, but then a recovery afterwards. It does mean we probably will have a little bit lower growth in 2020 than we originally expected, but it'll be enough to keep us in risk assets. So we're overweight in risk assets, and by that I mean equities, credit, those assets that do well when the economy uh, grows and when you know, investors are able to gain those um, returns from businesses they've invested in. Um, we prefer the US to other parts of the world, generally, although some areas like Europe and emerging markets are particularly cheap, so we're, we're putting a little bit more emphasis on those um, within portfolios. But as an example of balancing the short and the long term, you know, coronavirus in a sense is the ultimate short term event. Climate risk is maybe, it's not the ultimate long term event, but it's a very slow moving but very critical thing for us to consider. So we're thinking about climate risk and how we take account of that in our portfolios, how we ask boards the right questions in terms of how they're dealing with climate risk within our index portfolios. So like many asset managers, we're trying to balance short term pressures to forecast what's going to happen against those longer term trends that are really, really important. Mm. So what's an example of how you would start to factor in um, a, a change like you know, climate change, um, you know, governance, how does that factor in? To, how can you invest in that today when it's such an unquantifiable um, thematic or trend? Yeah. Well, there's, there's two things we can do, and, and we do do. One is, well, we've got very large index portfolios. Through our asset stewardship and proxy voting uh, policy, we ask companies, ask directors, particularly those companies that are most exposed, what their plan is. You know, what's their plan for different climate scenarios? How are they making their business resilient? That's not to micromanage the business, but it's certainly to make sure that investors of ours uh, know that those boards are focused on a very important long-term issue. Where we have the ability and where clients want us to focus on climate even more, we design portfolios that have very low carbon intensity relative to the kind of diversification within the portfolio. So we can tilt the portfolio away from the most carbon intensive and perhaps those companies that are most exposed to more severe government action on carbon uh, towards those that will benefit either through adaptation or through green revenue. So I think this is becoming a much more significant part of the, of the investment landscape. So a scenario like that, like, is, that a, is that a fringe style case for your investing at the moment or is that, is that pretty commonplace that you're having those conversations and making tilts accordingly? It, it really does um, depend where you are in the world, both geographically and in other senses. So, uh, in Northern Europe, for example, and to a certain extent in Australia, people expect you to be on top of these issues. Um, but I can tell you, in, in the Netherlands, in the pension uh, market, you wouldn't get very far as an asset manager unless you had a very, very clear understanding of climate risk and that you'd offered your clients the option of reducing climate risk within their portfolios. Mm -hmm. I think that mentality is cropping up increasingly in different parts of the world, but it's by no means universal. Let's dial it back. The world is too bearish. Take me through the, the, the key pillars that are un, 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 underpinning that um, you know, slightly risk on or tilt toward risk asset uh, yeah. position that you've got. I, I think, well, there's a couple of things. I think Larry Summers' secular stagnation hypothesis, which uh, is the idea that we'll have a very low growth rate and very low interest rates for a long time caused by a number of different factors. It's a plausible hypothesis, but it doesn't explain everything. And it particularly doesn't explain the growth of technology, 
um, or it doesn't encompass maybe the, the growth of technology and the growth of emerging markets and their potential to power global growth and therefore global profitability. But if you just pick technology and healthcare, for example, you know, think about the cost of genome sequencing, which has gone from maybe $2.7 billion back in the early 2000s to about $1,000 now. We have yet to reap the benefits of that reduction in cost in terms of customized medicine and diagnostics. But that's not just a good for humanity. It's actually a really, really important profit driver uh, that will keep um, industries like healthcare alive and profitable and providing us extraordinary returns. Even in a relatively low economic growth environment, those kind of technological advances can really power portfolio returns. So I think you can look at demographics and you look at some of the low interest rate projections into the future and get a little concerned, but you should remind yourself that the advances in technology are able to actually deliver very good long-term growth as well. What about the state of um, you know, the, the duration of, of, of the current economic cycle? Um, it's been something, uh, or the business cycle has been debated quite heavily. Um, you know, it seems like three or four years ago we've been talking about the fact that we're late cycle. Yeah. And 2019 um, markets put in circa 20% returns. Is there any, you know, reason why we can't we can't do that again in 2020? I mean, are you? We've, we've been told to expect lower returns, and then you know, 2019 we get that bumpy year. Yeah, I mean, I can remember back in 1991, you know, people were saying we should be expecting lower returns. Um, and in one sense, they were right. We had an enormous compression in bonds, uh, bond yield since 1991, uh, but actually risk assets have done pretty well, and the economies continue to turn. I think the concern now, rightly, is that we are very late into an economic cycle, particularly in the US, and we know they don't last forever. Now, sitting in Australia, it's interesting making that point because Australia's had an extraordinary run of positive economic growth uh, for a really long time, as has Poland, interestingly. So there's no magic answer that says, after a certain period of time, you're gonna have a recession. But economies tend to run out of steam and you can keep them going by lowering interest rates, but then you tend to stack up problems for the future. So we need to be prepared for that turn of the economic cycle. But we're not really at that point yet. There's no visibility on when we're going to have a credit squeeze, for example, in the US, um, or run out of factors of production. Unemployment's very low in the US, um, but I think you're seeing more people attracted to the workplace. Um, you're seeing more gender balance in many countries where you're attracting more women into the, to the workplace. So I think there is a possibility we can carry on for a little longer, but I'm not uh, in the mindset that these things carry on forever. We're going to reach the end. Could I get you to talk a little bit about the defensive part of the portfolios that you put together? One of the big debates that's been, that we've seen take place in Australia is that the bonds are in a bubble. Yeah. Um, and there's often been equity managers talking out, out about how expensive bonds look. There's been this great compression on yields. Yeah. What's your, um, do bonds still play their traditional defensive role in your portfolios? And what's your view on the valuations that you see um, in, in government bonds at the moment? Well, I mean, listen, when, when you've got negative yields, they're like expensive ballast. I mean, you know that they'll do well if you have a very sharp downturn, but it's a remarkably expensive way of, of buying insurance. Mm. And I think many of our clients are kind of concluding that they need to look for other options to insulate their portfolio. And we'd be absolutely with them. So we try, we're trying to avoid those safe haven bonds. But we should talk about defensive strategies in a more generic sense. And one of the things we're very proud of is what we've done in the equity markets, where we've designed defensive equity strategies, which are less exposed to those glamour stocks and those very volatile stocks, and maybe more focused on steady earners and those that we think are pretty undervalued. Now, those strategies can lose ground when you've got a very, very strong bull market. But they do perform a very interesting role in a portfolio when you've got you know, choppy market conditions, such as the ones we've just experienced in the last week or so. Mm. So I think it's not, it doesn't have to be about bonds. You can certainly design up other investment strategies uh, to cope with downturns. And you mentioned earlier um, gold for tail risks. Um, just talk to me about what sort of size allocation would a, a balanced style portfolio have to gold and, and when do you, what sort of role does that play for you? Well, it, I mean, it's, listen, it's had a great history, a couple of thousand years at least, of people having gold as their store of value. Uh, and if you ask, you know, will it be worth something in 100 years or 200 years? Pretty certain it's going to be worth something. You can't say that for every paper currency. So it's got a set of properties that are quite attractive. 
and it has very low correlation with some of the other assets in a typical portfolio. So I think we're seeing people turn to gold more in wealth management and you know, private portfolios than institutional portfolios, although central banks have been well known as, um, as buyers of gold for a long period of time. The challenge with gold is when you know it's under or overvalued. Uh, it's easy with stocks and bonds. Mm. But what we do know is that gold could have a, a good long-term position in a portfolio because of the way it offsets other risks. Yeah. So you've talked about um, uh, sort of a, a bias towards risk assets. Before we move on from, from the asset allocations, you know, your positioning, are there any parts of the market that you're absolutely steering well clear of? You know, <laughs> are there things that where, you, where you've gone dramatically underweight um, you know, other, other you know, countries or equity markets that you think look really dangerous? There's some things we prefer to, to others. So those, those smaller countries that are exposed to continuing trade tensions, um, they're vulnerable. Um, I mean, that being said, a lot of them are quite cheap. So we've, we've begun to put a little bit more uh, money into emerging market equities, which, which would encompass some of those. Uh, but we're still pretty cautious about those very open economies that have, you know, a little bit more vulnerability to the backwash of the U.S.-China uh, dispute, which is, you know, we got through phase one, but we're not yet at phase two. But we mentioned bonds before. I think, you know, we're really not that keen on negative yielding assets from a first principles perspective. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. And so we're avoiding those safer haven type assets. Um, and we think there's a lot of attractions in other parts of the bond market, whether it's corporate credit or, in fact, emerging market debt. Okay, great. Um, the, um, the president and the CEO of State Street, Cyrus Tara Poravala, correct? Yes. Um, gave a presentation um, on what the future of the asset management industry looked like. Mm. He called out 10 really interesting uh, trends and observations that are meant to be thought-provoking. I'll put a link below the, this video to that article. But one of the things he said is that he said asset allocation 10 years from now will be the new alpha. Yeah. Can you just break down that comment for me and explain, you know, what does that actually mean and, um, and why is it an important trend to be aware of? Yeah, I think because sometimes it's a neglected lever. And I think because we've lowered the cost of making these allocation decisions, either through ETFs or index funds or other, other kind of instruments, that you've opened up a kind of palette. You know, it's almost like you're a painter and suddenly you've got loads more paint in the paint box. Um, and you can paint a picture that's very sophisticated and looking for value in extraordinary places that maybe has been neglected in the past. So, you know, people sometimes have a preferred habitat. They say, well, I'm, I'm a fixed income investor and if I'm going to take risk, I, I go into corporate credit. The other thing that he talked about was the fact that he thought um, passive would make up 75% of, of, of managed funds and active would go to 25%. I'm interested to know, and I suspect you would have had discussions mm. internally, what active strategies will thrive 10 years from now? Where, where will the value be created there? Listen, I, I think it's, you know, it's a let a thousand flowers bloom. I think the 75% um, will require an implier change in the 25%. So if you wind the clock back, you know, 20, 30 years, a lot of the active management wasn't very active. I think knowing that passive is an option, investors are turning the dial up a little bit on active management and saying we've got to have it more active and also more distinctive. So the Thousand Flowers Bloom comment was that say that you'll have people who specialise, for example, in activism. So I, I find companies that aren't doing well, they need a management change and that's going to unleash a lot of value. You'll have others who are high frequency traders. You'll have others who are very, very long term investors, almost like a private equity style. So I think knowing that investors can have beta for a very low cost means that the alpha is going to be much more wide ranging um, and also more active. OK, interesting. Um, I want to get into a couple of personal questions. I know you, you represent State Street, but you obviously had a, a really long career and you work inside, a, I can't imagine the resources that you get access to at State Street. I'd just really like to um, understand at a personal level, what are some, you know, from all the experience you've had in markets, what are some of the, um, the philosophies that, that you kind of hold, hold core to your own beliefs? Like yeah. if you're teaching your grandkids or your kids or whatever it might be, um, how to invest, what are sort of, sort of things that you pass through there? 
Yeah, I think you've got to, you've got to develop strong convictions in investing um, because there's a lot of noise out there. So you've got to have things to hold on to that you know, you will get you through the noise. But I think one of the lessons of investments is don't, you know, don't hold on to those things so tightly that they fly in the face of all the facts. And I think when you've lived through a lot of investment markets, you know, starting with a crash in 87, bond market in 94, and then you realize a lot of the things you were holding on to, you need to keep questioning. So that's not to say you don't believe in uh, you know, these strong conviction ideas, uh, but you've got to assimilate new information. Say, what did I learn from that? So what did I learn out of the 2008 crisis? Um, I thought I was pretty smart before then, but there were certainly a lot of things that happened then that we weren't expecting. Uh, and that helps you prepare for the next, if not the next crisis, then the next challenge. I think that's a kind of personal uh, journey that investors have to go on. Um, and certainly one that I've gone on. So okay to, to change your mind based on your information? Yeah, but not like a weather vane. I yeah. mean, you've got to have some degree of conviction, but you've got to assimilate the fact to say, Let, let's test that against what I know. Okay, what else? Is there anything else? Well, I think it, financial markets should make us focus on the end customer. At the end of the day, financial markets are just a way of linking people who've got savings uh, to people who need those savings to do something in the real world. And we shouldn't forget that we're the bit in the middle, and our obligation is to be super efficient in serving, if you're in the asset management business, the saver. You need to make sure you're focused on, on his or her needs and making sure you do that, and not focus on your own industry necessarily. Yeah. All righty, final one. Um, and it's a question that we ask all of our guests when they come in. Um, I was hoping you could share a, a, a lesson um, that, that you learned, a, a, a difficult lesson that you picked up somewhere along the way where, um, you know, it's made you a better investor, you had to reflect. Um, could you tell me a story about what happened and just ex explain the lesson that, that you've taken away that you think is, makes you a better investor today? Yeah, let me think, well, there have been quite a few, obviously starting from the crash, but that's so long ago it's, it's almost hard to remember now. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that was really interesting and informative, 1994, where we had bond market, a you know, very, very sharp correction, um, and we developed strategies that were exploiting you know, potential from bonds. And as that bear market unfolded, we realized we should turn the strategy on its head. So to be a little bit more flexible and say, how can we profit from bonds that are in a bear market? And really think about the problem in a totally different way. In other words, saying, we're not bond investors. We're not, you know, we're not tied to the idea of always owning bonds. We can go on the other side of that trade. So I think it's important as markets change that you reevaluate what you're doing. So that was a really important lesson for me because before that fact, and it's a little bit like negative yields, mm. no one really believed you to see that sharp uh, sort of reaction. I think negative yields are, again, enabling us to think differently about bond markets. Okay, great. Well, listen, Rick, thank you very much for taking the time to come and sit down with us. Uh, enjoy your trip to Australia. And um, yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to share some insights, particularly on um, some of the passive strategies and, and how you think about investing in 2020. Thank you.